two other spotlights that deserve attention during this talk. In fact, we've actually encountered it during the first half. So let me introduce them to you officially. To your left is problems and to your right, solutions. Whether we are designing in our professional life, maybe as engineers, architects, product designers, entrepreneurs, leaders, or whether we are designing our own personal life as parents, spouses, children, would you all agree that we are constantly juggling between these two or navigating the space in between? Further, over the last several years, we've begun to realize that the more solutions we are coming up with as humans, the bigger the problem circle is growing. More pollution, more stress, competition, shortage of resources, extinction of species. And this problem circle looks far more dangerous than what we initially started with. Now, isn't that a bit weird? Shouldn't the problems reduce as the solutions grow? So the real question facing us designers is, is there a new way of finding solutions without creating a problem? Since childhood, I've been deeply connected to nature and always enjoyed being outdoors. I also love design and business, and that's what got me into 16 years of advertising. Right through my advertising, nature was my complete go-to place to relax and rejuvenate. However, the separation between nature and business and constantly having to choose either or just didn't feel right within. It became my vision to find a way of working at the intersection of these three elements, business, nature and design. So between the years 2013 and 2015, I began to reflect deeply on the problem circle that was growing and wanted to find a way to find some answers and therefore quit advertising. And guess where my questions led me back to? Into nature, my favorite place. But this time, I entered this world with a whole new perspective and lens called biomimicry, which is about learning from nature and not just about nature. And it's this whole paradigm shift that occurred within me that shifted the way I began to understand problems that I share with you today in the form of three stories. At the end of the talk, we can take home three learnings from this. The first story starts 4.5 billion years ago. Many of you might have heard or read about it in parts or whole. But it's when Dr. Dana Baumister, the co-founder of Biomimicry 3.8, began to talk about it in a much larger context, it completely shifted a powerful chord in my heart. In order to make it easier to understand, the 4.5 billion years has been crunched into one calendar year, January to December. January 1st, when the Earth was born, and December 31st, as we are all sitting here today. Let us see what the story reveals to us. January 1st, our planet Earth is born 4.5 billion years ago. February, the first form of life appears as a single cell bacteria 3.8 billion years ago. Remember, first life appeared 3.8 billion years ago. March, photosynthesis, a very important process, showed up on this earth. April, May, June and July, no other life appeared. But in August, eukaryotes started appearing on this earth. These are cells with a nucleus and a cell membrane. In September, sexually reproducing organisms appeared for the first time on this earth. October was quiet, but in November, there was a frenzy of life forms. First came the fungi, followed by the fish, 
then the plants, and by end November, we began to see insects as well. December was no less. It started with the amphibians, followed by the reptiles, and by mid-December, we see mammals on this earth. Note, we are in mid-December, and there's still no sign of the human species. Mammals are followed by birds, and who follows the birds but the flowers? We now come to the last day of the year. Where are we? At 11.30 a.m., the hominids appear. But it's not until 11.24 p.m., just 36 minutes before midnight, that we, the humans or the homo sapiens, show up on this earth. Just 36 minutes before midnight. So if we are so young as a species, how young is our design and innovation? Let us see. Agriculture appears at 11.59 p.m. just a minute ago. But the industrial revolution of 200 years, which we think we innovated, discovered, invented, appears at 11.59 p.m. just a second ago. So, we are 36 minutes old, agriculture is a minute old, and our design and innovation, just a second old. So, this solution circle that we are looking at is just a minute old. And yet, we are constantly trying to find better ideas in this one minute and making our mistakes a lot more severe when we have access to 3.8 billion years of wisdom available to us. And like Dr. Janine Benius, the founder of Biomimicry says, this wisdom is available right outside the door for free. You may be wondering, does nature hold answers to all the human problems? And that brings me to the second story about the nature solution circle and the possibilities it holds. Over 30 to 100 million species inhabit the earth today. They live on the same planet as we do, in the same environmental conditions as we live in, and face the same challenges. And yet, in the number of years that they have been evolving, which is 3.8 billion years, they've constantly created conditions conducive for life. They have been building. Look at the architecture. On the left is a weaver bird nest, and on the right is a wasp nest. They have been manufacturing electricity and material. So on the left is the electric eel that produces electricity in its abdominal organs and nothing happens to it. And on the right is the abalone shell which is found at the bottom of the ocean and it's 200 times stronger as a ceramic than anything man-made today. They have been creating color through structure and not pigments. The only color present in the peacock is the brown pigment. But it's the nanostructure on its tail feathers that reflect the sunlight and give birth to that iridescent colors. They have been communicating long distances. Elephants can communicate with their herd up to 50 kilometers using low frequency vibrational sounds, which is why it is said that during the tsunami, they managed to escape when humans were still trying to figure out what hit them. Not only that, they have been doing packaging design. On the left are the lotus seeds. Where do they grow? In water. And so their seeds are designed to float in the water till they find an environment to grow. On the right is the dandelion seeds. They are dispersed with wind. So therefore their seeds have those parachute-like structures that allow them to fly. They have large organizations. Take an ant colony, termite colony, forests, honeybees. Over 80,000 individuals live in each colony and they know how to communicate using simple rules and simple forms of uh, decision making. 
and now organizations are studying them. So name any function and nature has already solved for it. Not only that, they've done that without releasing toxins, without creating waste and without harming other life on earth. On the contrary, they constantly create conditions conducive to more life, giving birth to more diversity and beauty. Learning these strategies from nature, understanding the mechanism behind it and emulating it or mimicking it consciously to create sustainable human designs is biomimicry. In other words, biomimicry is sustainable innovation and design inspired by nature. So, as a biomimic, I'm first trained to quieten my human cleverness and then ask the question, how does nature solve this challenge? And this challenge is any function or problem you're trying to solve, no matter which discipline you are from. So are designers looking at this new way of solving problems? That brings me to the third story which happens at the intersection of business, nature and design. And yes, designers from different disciplines are taking the question to nature and finding aesthetic, profitable and sustainable designs. The question is, how does nature and then the challenge? Over a hundred million birds die in Europe each year, crashing into over a hundred million birds die each year, crashing into glass surfaces. They see the reflection of the sky in the glass and then go crashing right into it. So Arnold Glass Company, which is based in Germany, studied the orbit spiders. They weave UV reflective fibers into the web which the birds can see and therefore not crash into them. So they mimicked this strategy and released Ornilux glass in 2006. When tested, nine out of 10 birds avoided colliding into this glass. It's now being used widely in residential buildings as well as in commercial buildings. How does nature repel bacteria? So we use a lot of chemicals and antimicrobials to sterilize surfaces which in turn pollute the water. Dr. Anthony Brennan, a university professor of Florida, actually studied the Galapagos shark skin because it repels bacteria. He found small tooth-like structures on its skin which makes it difficult for the bacteria to attach itself. He founded Sharklet technology which emulates these surfaces. And when tested, it prevents bacterial attachment by 90%. It's now being used in hospital settings, medical equipment, and in public places. How does nature manufacture 100% non-toxic glue? We've all seen glue muscles that attach themselves to the rocky surfaces where the waves hit them. But no matter how much the waves pound on them, they continue to stay attached. Dr. Lee, a scientist from the Oregon University, was so fascinated that these blue muscles produce 100% non-toxic glue in their glands. He experimented and modified soy proteins to mimic the marine adhesive proteins and partnered with Columbia Forest Products to release the first 100% non-toxic glue called Pure Bond. When used in the manufacturing units, it reduced air pollutant emissions between 50 to 90 percent. How does nature manage high temperatures? Losfi Company Private Limited is a Japanese company and they have a product now called Komolevi Forest Canopy. They basically mimic the fractal patterns of leaves and tree branches in nature. They have two layers. The upper layer is a triangular uh, leaf pattern that basically moves faster in small amplitude and the lower layer is a hexagonal shape and it moves slower with a large amplitude. This simulates the feeling of sitting under the tree and because it has holes, it allows the air to pass through and you won't believe it. It is 12 degrees to 15 degrees 
cooler under the forest canopy. Imagine using this in exhibition tents, atriums and open air cafes. How much energy can we all conserve? Interface is one of the largest carpet manufacturing companies in the world. But the founder, Ray Anderson, realized that it's a highly polluting industry. So in the late 1990s, he decided that he wants to make his company 100% sustainable by 2020. He hired the biomimicry design team in the late 1990s to remove and eliminate waste from the manufacturing process. They studied the forest floor and emulated it and introduced the world's first biomimetic tile that doubled their profits between 2002 and 2007. But they didn't stop there. They now wanted to eliminate glue in the installation process because glue is carcinogenic. Again, they study the forest flow. How does it stick to the earth? Using gravity. So, they introduced a product called Tactiles and eliminated glue completely from the installation process. They went another step further. They now are starting a factory in New South Wales, Australia, which basically mimics and wants to function like a forest. Not to look like a forest, but to function like a forest. So they are studying the ecosystem in New South Wales and figuring out how does it purify water? How does it sequester carbon? How does it build diversity? How does it build relationships? Because that is what they want their factory to do. So you can emulate it in the level of form, in the level of process, and in the level of systems. As for me, my vision of working at the intersection of business, nature, and design is starting to ring true. As a biomimicry consultant, I apply nature's lessons to leadership design and organizational design. I also want to spread the practice of biomimicry to multidisciplinary designers. It's these three stories that completely shifted my perspective in the way how I begin to look at problems. Even though we are the last to arrive on this earth, we are still very much a part of nature. We are nature. Like in the beginning I told you, each one of us here are designers. We may be either designing our personal life or our professional life. So I want to leave you behind with three learnings to take home as designers. Nature can be our mentor. With 3.8 billion years of wisdom, who better to be our mentor than nature? Design with nature as a model. If we take our questions right outside the door, 30 million species are available to whom we can ask the question and they have strategies to be our model. Finally, we can look to nature as a measure. Like I said, everything in nature is not only beautiful, elegant, sustainable, but there's one more thing. It's life-centered and not just human-centered. And that's the true measurement of success to live on this earth. So if we are designing, we can look at our designs and ask, does this fulfill all of this? And if the answer is yes, move ahead. But if it's a no, knock on nature's door again. Because when we design like the rest of the species, we not only belong to the circle of nature, we belong to a much larger circle called planet Earth. Thank you.